Carson, Leno, Fallon. Now, it's Wine Talks with Paul K. Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. And we are at a way game today in the beautiful Napa Valley. About to have a conversation with Gary Fish, the founder and CEO of Gary's Wine Marketplace. Introductions in just a moment. Wine Talks, of course, available iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, wherever you hang out. But, uh, you know, we have an interesting time here because we're up in the Napa Valley. I just had a great conversation with Trevor Durling from BV Vineyards, one of the great historical wineries uh, of the Napa Valley. And also with a young man, a complete opposite idea, uh, a young man named Jay Nunez, who actually brought your name up, I think. Oh, um, good. And brought up, uh, uh, yeah, he said, what a nice guy he is. Well, anyway, welcome to the show, Gary. <laughs> uh, Paul, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for taking the time. And I thanks for coming you. on the road. Well, this this is hard work. Yeah. Right? We got to get on the get my wife on a plane and fly her to Napa Valley. This is not a big problem for us. Well, where is she? She should be in the store shopping. She was she she didn't feel well this morning. Uh, I said because she, she loves your store, so she's like, oh, you know. But I just got to stay home and rest if we're going to go out tonight. Uh, where are we headed? We're we're headed to La Cadena, which is um, Keller's yeah. Mexican restaurant. Mexican. We've, awesome already, we've already done the rest. So, anyways, this is interesting because this was not. Let me take my jacket off. It's too hot. Um, this was Dina DeLuca, right? Yeah, it was Dina DeLuca until they left in uh, July 5th of 2019. And how did you stumble across the fact that this was available? You're New Jersey. Most, all, you're 100% New Jersey besides the store? Yes. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I had a moment of weakness. No, yeah. I, you know, I've been tr- coming to Napa Valley since 1980. Yeah. Uh, end of 79, beginning of 80. And for the last 20 years, when I would come to Napa Valley... Uh, I would come every February for premiere in Napa, mm-hmm. and I would come usually once or twice uh, beyond that every year. And I came in, and one of my stops was Dina DeLuca, right? I, I love caffeine. So whether we're coming up or down Valley, yeah. I'd, I'd, we would pull over, grab a cup of coffee, espresso, uh, maybe some cheese or charcuterie or a Danish, and head to the next stop. I was here in February of 2019, and it looked like there was something wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, the energy wasn't here. Uh, the shelves were empty. That's always a good sign. Yeah, or, or <laughs> becoming sign. empty, yes. and it just didn't feel good. And uh, a friend of mine had worked for Dina DeLuca under Leslie Rudd. And mm-hmm. so I gave him a call, and he said that, yeah, the owners were having some trouble, but paying their bills, or paying rent anyway. Yeah. And so I left it at that. I came back in May, and I saw it. It was dead. There was nothing here. The coffee was burnt. It tasted terrible. And I called my wife, and I said, what do you think about if Dean and DeLuca goes out of business of us taking it over? And I'm convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt she was doing a crossword puzzle, and she wasn't listening. (laughs) <laughs> and she said, sure, honey, anything you want to do is, is fine with me. She has something else on her mind. Yeah. She's crazy. <laughs> uh, and so we, we did it. You wow. know, we, we talked to them and they said, well, they'll let us know uh, if and when Dean and DeLuca goes out. And July 5th, we got a call that they left. Uh, so that's Rudd, as in the Rudd Estates? Leslie Rudd Rudd. Estates owns the, Leslie Rudd's estate owns the land. And, the, uh, the and real as well estate. as uh, the a Press Restaurant. Yeah, and exactly. Well, oh, that's really interesting. And so they... Did they did they shut down all of the country because they were in New York? I yeah, they they went bankrupt, so they wow. they left everything. Why does that uh, happen in a retail world like this? Oh, so your lots, place is busy today. It's busy today, but it's I got to tell you, it's been a war. Yeah. It's you know it's tough business. Uh, retail's tough in general. Uh, Napa Valley has been um, and continues to be the biggest and hardest challenge I've ever faced in retail. Wow! Um, when you opened your first store in 1987. With your brother, yeah, in Madison was Madison being a populous part of New Jersey. So Madison's, it's not only populous, uh, but it's a good demographic. It's mm-hmm. on the train line to Midtown Manhattan. No, uh, so we're, we're, I'm not sure I'm a fan of the term, but we're a bedroom community. Yeah. So a lot of people work in the city or have worked in the city and and live in Madison, Chatham, um, that area. Uh, we have three universities nearby, and four or five, five, four or five Fortune 500 companies oh, so have their world headquarters. Traffic. So it's a, it's got the wealth and density, as well as uh, 
commuters and students, which is a good base for employees. Um, which we're going to talk about. <laughs> so, so that's something that, that we had. In, well, in sounds like a Cobb to Madeline, you know, across the street from IBM and all the big corporations, American corporations with Steven Spurrier's store in Paris as right. it got growing. And so as you grew in Madison, it looked like you had something right. What was this mentality? I mean, retail's tough, and I, I spent most of my life uh, selling wine for my father and, and liquor. And it's a tough racket in a bedroom community as well, Palos Verdes Estates. Hmm. Um, but what was in your head when you started this? Like, I want to create the best wine shop ever. I want to create a wine shop where there's a huge variety. I want to create a wine shop at the best prices. What was your, what were you thinking? I don't want to go out of business. <laughs> well, that's it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, when, when uh, I was 28 or 29, going on 29, and uh, when I was a liquor salesman for, uh, it's called Fedway now, a New Jersey wholesaler. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, one of my accounts, I had mostly restaurants because I enjoyed making wine lists and talking about wine and, and doing that. But one of my uh, liquor store owners had a store in Madison and for many reasons needed to sell it. And he needed to sell it quickly and he couldn't take it back. So it had to be like a final transaction. And he brought me into his office one day, which was probably the same size as this office, except for had papers, reports piled everywhere. And he said, kid, I have an opportunity for you, but you could never quit your job because it'll never be big enough. Wow. Would you be interested in buying this store? Wow. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't have any money. Oh, uh, that's a small detail. And <laughs> he said, well, you need money. Uh, so we, we had just bought a house, uh, my wife and I, and I uh, called my brother. Uh, and he s called me back the next day and said, we're in. Whatever you come up with, we'll match it. Wow. So I still have no money. Yeah, right. But you just bought a house. And so we, we know, did house. some of the creative things you do when you need money. So I came up with uh, not an enormous amount. My brother came up with the same, went to the owner and said, this is the amount of cash I have available. And he said, okay, done. Uh, and he, uh, we wrote the agreement based upon a long period of time to pay it off. Yeah, the rest so that he wouldn't take it back, so he couldn't take it back. Right. And uh, literally, it was a 700-square-foot store. Really? Uh, no, 1,200-square-foot store doing $700,000 worth of business. Really? And in 1987. In, 1980, in 1987. And if you remember 1987, there was an economic meltdown, right? That yes. Was, that was the whole... Uh, um, was it liquor and ice and beer and ice, or was it... You know, fine wines. It as was well. a liquor store. Yeah. It was uh, Jugs, Palmason, Almaden, yeah. Inglenook, Lancers, uh, Francia, Box, Lancers, <laughs> Matus, Bud, Coors, Miller. Wow. Uh, and handles of Dewars and Schmirnoff and Bacardi. Wow. You know, that's kind of what wow. the store was. And I quickly, I was in love with wine. So I started tasting wine and, and we, we had no room or money. So I bring in three cases, and over the weekend, that's what I would focus on. Next week, I'd bring in six cases and two different wines, and that's what I'd focus on. So we started growing from that point. Do you think your wholesale side, because you know, such different animals, and we have, you know, we've all seen vendors come and go, kids that are trying to sell liquor, and then they go into wine shops or whatever. But do you think that that background as a wholesale liquor salesman? had value to your retail experience? I mean, did you bring anything to the table? Oh, that? absolutely. You know, I was, I was so young, right? So I, I didn't know what I didn't know, which was everything. Which is good. <laughs> and I knew that wine was becoming more of a thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe I was on the cutting edge or anything. I just thought, this is a great community, right? The economics are there. The demographics are there. And the world is changing. It felt good to be shifting out of liquor, you mm -hmm. know, or out of sales. Mm -hmm. But I called on restaurants, I called on bars, I called on liquor stores. And by doing that, you, you see things. Mm -hmm. And wherever I traveled because of that, I would try to find restaurant, a good restaurant to go to dinner. I would look at any, any of the wine shops or liquor stores in that community, whether it was coming to Napa and visiting Louis Martini in, mm -hmm. in 1979. My wow. first trip was that wow. I visited wow. with him. Um, or wherever I went. And I just had a sense of what, what retail was about. Um, it's not training, but it was more of a, 
a, a sense is the best way to put it. Why did your dad come out here in 1987, uh, not 87, but in 79, 79, 78, for this Louis Martini training? And back then, there were like 50 wineries in no, there. No, no, I did. Oh, you did? Dad. I thought this thing said your father brought you out there. No. Oh. No, so you my, went out on your own. Yeah. I was Louis Martini. So I was, so backtrack, right? I graduate college, and my father was a liquor salesman. Yes. And in college, I had one goal, right? Uh, to be president of the United States. It was, you know, everybody's got to have a goal, <laughs> yeah. right? You're ambitious. <laughs> and so uh, I was president of university for two years. Sophomore and junior year, I was president of our university. Yeah, um, student body. Which was pretty good. Yes. You know, it was really good. It was good for me. It, it, it got me out of my shell. Yeah, yeah I'm having uh, trouble finding that shell. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but my focus was really in that arena, not in studying. Yeah. So I didn't have a great academic background. You know, I, a C for me was great. Yeah. Um, but when it came to time to graduate in my university, uh, a lot of accountants, they, they, that was their thing, business school, a lot of accountants. So half my, three quarters of my friends were going into accounting firms. Wow. I got a degree in political science and a minor in English. So no political science stores to go to. So. No, and, and no jobs. Right. And my father was a liquor salesman, yeah. so he said, kid, why don't you sell liquor? And he was in his mid-60s when I graduated college. And he said, at some point, you know, you could take over some of my accounts or do whatever. So I, I did. So I started in 1979 as a liquor salesman. And uh, there was a vacation the summer of 79. It was a union, so they had a forced vacation. Yeah. Uh, one my uh, big brother my fraternity lived in L.A. Uh, so I said, well, I'll come out. And he said, well, if you're coming out and if you visit a winery, it's a tax deduction. Wow. So we, I flew what out, we met in San Francisco, pull up here. Louis Martini was the only Napa cab, I, Napa winery yeah, I had. Right. And I had a point with Louis Martini now, picture. You the know, man himself. I, and I was not, you know, I was a kid from New Jersey. Yeah, right. And I expected the CEO of a company. Yeah. What I got was a farmer. Louis was a right. big old farmer, sure. right? And right. I, I had no concept. I visited wow. one other winery before that, and that yeah. was Manischewitz in Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there were no grapes or winemakers, no, but there was the a rabbi. lot of <laughs> a rabbi overseeing it uh, and train cars bringing Concord in yeah. from uh, train cars of Concord and sugar. I don't oh, know what's boy. going on there. Delicious. So when I met Louis, I was really expecting to see That's meet with the CEO, That's but he, he, he farmed the grapes. He, he told people when to pick it. He was out in the vineyards. Um, he, he, when, when we got there, uh, it was August and it was an early harvest. Uh, so they had truck, tractor, tra back then it was the 18 wheelers with the big tubs of grapes on the yeah, back. Right. So he helped, cause I couldn't get up myself. He helped me get on the back of the truck and, and I took a grape from the top of the bin and then one below and it wow. was starting to crush. And he says, see, it's starting to ferment already. What an you know, what an we experience. may not accept this, you know? So. Um, then he took me into the cellar, and ironically, uh, Carolyn Martini's daughter was here today. Uh, a, she heard I, I always spoke highly of her father, and yeah. B, she's at making wine or something. So yeah, yeah, we yeah. chatted today. It was very. That's it was exciting. nice to catch up. That's you know? really exciting. And I got jazzed about Louis Martini. Yeah. You know, so I came back. I took Kevin Zarelli's Windows of the World three or four times mm -hmm. in the early '80s, and while the liquor guys in New Jersey were selling liquor, I wasn't selling any liquor because they, they looked at me and said, what do you know, kid? You know, you're 21 years old. Yeah, right. Um, but nobody was talking about wine. So no. I started focusing Even on wine. in the 80s because, uh, you, know, you know, that's 12 years past um, the Judgment of Paris. Uh, even Jim Barrett didn't retire from his law practice until like 86. Yeah, no, it was, so, it was infancy, yeah. you know. And when I made a wine list as a wholesaler, it was uh, M&R, Martini Rossi Asti Spumanti, yeah. Lancers Blue Nun, um, That's fascinating. Moet White Star, um, B&G Beaujolais, B&G Pouille Fousse, yeah. and then Louis Martini Cabernet, and Wente Brothers Chardonnay. That was so, my wine list. So this idea that, um, that Mr. Martini was a farmer sort of stunned you because you think it's big business at this point or you just were not ready yeah, for that it's i thought it's a company right yeah. a, a big company that's right. what you deal with right and it stunned me because 
he's a guy, a person, mm -hmm. growing grapes, right? It's not a manufactured product no, anymore in my right. mind, right? It, 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 a bottle has a label. It feels like it's manufactured. Right. This is a guy who's making the wine. And it's passion. Yeah. It's and when passionate. he described every wine and we chatted and walked through it, I, I, I was like, I became so energized. I always joke that I became an ambassador for Louis Martini wines as True. opposed to salesman. So my whole mind shifted. And by doing that allowed when this opportunity came up to buy a liquor store. First of all, had I not been on the wine side of it, this account of mine wouldn't have asked me to buy the store. Yeah, right. Um, so it's a, it's about good fortune, it's all, it's all, you know, and timing. It's, just, it's very inspiring. Do you think that and I have this conversation a lot with the winemakers up here, that the people that come up here, they've made money as surgeons or asphalt contractors or all the different <laughs> trades that you can do to make a lot of money and then decide you want to be in the wine business. Do you think that's a, a revelation that they weren't aware of, that you, know, you really are farmers and that it's about the land and the grapes and what you're trying to do? Or is it about how fancy you can build your chateau and, and, and groom your grounds? I'm not sure it's a one-size-fits-all answer. Yeah. You know, The reality is there's still a lot of farmer uh grape growers yes right uh some of them are, are huge andy baxter mm -hmm. he's a grape grower he's yeah. a farmer right you're right you know don't let the southern charm fool you right uh, <laughs> but but at the end of the day his passion is growing grapes yeah. and running a business that way and there are other you know the novaks at spotswood yes they their primary focus is farming their grapes but they're also business people and the new generation coming in um, some of them are just looking for lifestyle, and if that lifestyle, lifestyle has 30 acres of vineyards and a beautiful house or chateau, um, but they're also, I believe, many of them care about the, in this case, Napa Valley, and what Napa Valley represents, and what their legacy will represent. Because you have to, I mean, you have to look at this and come up here. I just read an article in the in the Yonville Sun that the average Cabernet this year was eighty eight hundred dollars a ton, which as you and I know in broad strokes is about ninety dollars a bottle on the shelf. You know, that's the tough sell. And you're you're going through that right now. Yeah. Eight thousand dollars a ton. Yeah, eight thousand what did I say? I thought you said eight hundred, uh, but eight, I could have eight yeah. hundred dollars a ton. Yeah, I mean it's that's a tough racket. I mean you you got a lot invested in the young man I that spoke highly of you yesterday, Jay Nunez, who's this young kid trying to get, cut some teeth. He's talking about his $50,000 loan that he had to do with wine in the barrel. And do I sell it off in bulk to pay the, make the payment or do I s figure out a way to make the payment and bottle it and sell it? Tough, tough decision to make for a young guy. It's, it's a huge decision. And, and, you know, and, and in retail, we'll come back to that. But yeah. in, in that world, it's, it's hard because there's almost no right answer. And I'm going to segue. Yeah. Um, we have a label called Go Figure, which I brought here. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You, and what that simple. is, is I'm going to call it in quotations, leftover fruit. Yeah. So in the case of this young man, uh, he brings in his fruit and he's got three barrels worth of Cabernet. Yeah. Going to sell for 150 bucks a bottle, right? He's got to pay to, for the barrels. He's got to pay to bottle it. He's got to age it for a year, year and a half, two years. All that money keeps going out. Right. Right. Then he's got to sell the wine once it's bottled. Right. We worked out a deal uh, that we, we've created about 12, 15 years ago now where we'll, we'll buy one of his barrels. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it's usually somebody that has more. So somebody right. has 10, right, 12 right. barrels of wine and Good they only barrel. need eight. They do their blend. They l either have three barrels sitting there, and then we'll, they'll blend it and we'll taste it. Or they do the blend, and the blend comes to 1,000 cases of wine, but they know they can only sell 700. Or they would love to cash out, take some chips off the get table. Some, yes, get, get some and of so money And so we, we, we literally contract to have them bottle it for us. Right. Uh, we buy it on the spot immediately, usually two years before they would release their wine. They get paid in 30 days. You know, in New Jersey, we, unheard of. we go through a wholesaler, <laughs> yeah, so they right. get paid in 30 days. So while they're waiting a year, year and a half for the rest of their wine to be ready to be, go to market, they've, they've cashed out some of it. They get much more money than they would get in the bulk market. Right. And that's 
a a win-win and that's what our relationships have done for that's us and I don't negotiate usually which don't tell anybody that because yeah. New Jersey <laughs> retailer the, yeah, by, by definition of New Jersey retailer, <laughs> of course. everything's a negotiation. Of course. With this, I want the, the whoever's fruit to be very happy and want to sell it to yeah, us. And, and do it again next time yeah, if exactly. it's available. But I think the important point you just made about what this business is, is that there's all, it's because it's agricultural, it's not a widget, you don't make it, you can't crank up the factory to make more when you want to, is that you may end up short and you may end up long. And when you end up long, and I think... I think the statistic is something like 95% of wine is bottled by somebody other than this, the grower. You know, it's kind of a, it kind of dampens the whole romantic part of it, but it's true, right? Well, right. I, I mean, it's a bit, at the end of the day, it's a business. Yes. It's, if you have enough money that it's not a business, it's a different discussion. But well, you're, yeah, I don't want to interrupt you for a second. This is no. a question I love asking you because of your insightful retail side. And you said it, it is a business. We're in to make money. When I was negotiating all these years for thousands of cases at a time, it got to the point where the vendors knew and my relationships knew what I was expecting. They right. just came in with the price. We never really pushed back that much. But what if profit had nothing to do with this? Would the wine, how would the wine industry be if, if we weren't worried about making a profit? Would we? One answer I got yesterday was that we'd have more varietals because we'd, we'd experiment with more stuff. And it's a tough question because there's so many moving parts. But I wonder if it would be more honest, if there'd be more, less manipulation, there'd be more, not say natural wine, but wines of... Right, yeah, don't say natural wine. Yeah, I hate that, I know, I agree. Uh, we'll talk about that too. But, but it's interesting, but you, you, you bring up a great point, right? Uh, with the whole uh, Spectator Parker in the day, mm -hmm. and I think we're past that yes. to, to some degree. I agree. Um, yeah, we're on suckling now. <laughs> Winemakers yes. started picking a little later to get higher bricks, to get more sugar, to get a little more ripeness and sweetness, because that's what Parker liked, right? right. That was the style, j bigger, jammier, juicier, um, leave it in wood a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. All of that costs money. And everybody then creates a big Napa Cabernet that gets 99 points. Right. That was the goal. That was it. Uh, we had a winemaker in yesterday, a lovely woman, and her goal this year is to taste 200 different Grape varieties. 200 varieties? Yes. That's Unbelievable. In and Napa? Not Napa variety. Not, no. She, but, she is in Napa. She works oh, in Napa. Okay. But she's buying wines from Greece. She bought a couple Italian right. wines here yesterday that had varietals that, that hit her list that she hadn't tasted yet. And she said, you know, if I didn't make Napa Cab, in if I could if I could get more money for a Gruner Valleyner in Napa mm -hmm. or a esoteric white grape, I would make that in a heartbeat. Yeah, because these wines are vivacious and they're fun and they're fresh and and they've got nice flavor. But in Napa Valley, Cabernet is king. It's economic, eight thousand dollars a ton, which and I think some could be up to twelve thousand or more. It said the highest was eleven something. Right, but if you're doing a Chenin Blanc. No, yeah, or fifteen hundred dollars a ton, maybe. So most. the price goes down dramatically. Yeah. It's the same acreage, right? So you're going to have to produce Cabernet. So to your point, if money had no bearing on anything, I think you would see a lot more uh, selection. A lot you think more consumers different. would catch? Like, let's go to Umbria in Italy, where you know they keep finding these rare grapes that, and making wines from them. They're fabulous, particularly the whites. Right. You know, right? I'm sure, hopefully, your friend has tasted some of these. Do you think that the consumer would figure this out? Do you think they would understand, like, let me back up a little bit. Of the 49,000 acres planted, I read this all today, so I'm not a brilliant statistician. Of the 49,000 acres in Napa, 25,000 is Cabernet. That's the cash crop. Yeah, of course. Right? Okay. So do we think that, well, here in your shop, if somebody walks in and they're looking for that giant cab, okay, you'll sell it to them, but does anybody walk in and say, hey, Trying to find something different. What do you have that's got this uh, tropical nose and whatever? Yeah, uh, the the winemakers. Yeah, <laughs> the wine but it's oh, really? true because you know half of our. Okay, you that's know, funny. And we'll get. I'd like to at some point touch back on the retail here a little yes, bit. Yes, we're going to. For um, sure. But you know, the we see winemakers and uh, vineyard managers and production people. And owners. Why do they come here? They just because your selection and your knowledge base? No, because they like me. Oh, okay. well, I'm kidding. <laughs> that, that has nothing to do with it. Uh, 
can, we're, can, we're, at a, we're at a great place, yeah, location. For sure. Um, but we, we've, my goal when we created this was to have a wide range. Uh, so we have wines for the locals to sell to the mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, visitors. Mm-hmm. So we have a great selection of Napa Valley, right. all things Napa. Of but the, the people that make Napa Cab don't want to drink Napa Cab every no, night for dinner. Of course not. So we have great Burgundy, we have Alsatian, we have Rhone wines, we German wines. So we, we run the gamut. And the people that have the most interest in wine are the people in the trade that live in the area. Uh, the tourists that come in either want a big cab because that's what they're drinking. We had a group just now by opus to walk around and taste drink while they were shopping oh that's the usual five six hundred bottle of wine yeah (laughs) i mean that's what you do and uh, you know but but that's not the real world you know it's not the real world so it's 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 a different environment here completely because when i was i'll just my my brief history 35 years hundred thousand wines i've tasted i've probably curated 20 million bottles of wine we just sold the company last week, closed escrow. Uh, COVID was incredible for us, but I've, I had an awful first quarter this year. I, my wife and I are planning on moving on to mostly wine media. Got a couple of things I'm working on, but it's a tough, it's a weird consumer environment right now. And you're probably seeing it right here, right now. What has changed for you since you opened the store in this location? Well, since, and, and it's, Two parts, this store and New Jersey. Yeah. This store has been a nightmare since we opened. Yeah. You know? Because the square footage, the inventory count. Uh, well, let's start off with we opened October 4th. They turned the power off October 7th of 19. Uh, fire started. Oh, that really? Wow. So, I didn't realize so, that. Uh, so literally, we opened on the 4th. Yeah. We had dinner with dear friends, and Andy Bextoffer was at this dinner yeah. on the 4th. That's a, Normally, I wouldn't remember the date, but I remember this. Yes. And uh, they were talking about the potential of a fire because it had been very dry. And somebody in locally had said it could be the sixth or seventh. And Andy said, no, it, the weather pattern would be the 17th or something. Uh, they turned off our power on the seventh, three days after we were open, Jeez. no notice. We lost all our cheese. Wow. Uh, we reopened, the fire started probably the day Andy thought it would. We lost our power, closed, reopened. Best week, uh, couldn't get help. So we opened short staffed. Finally got going March 1st through March 15th were the two best weeks we've ever had in 2020. 2020. Then we closed, uh, lost staff. Um, Huh, Because, because of COVID? Yeah. Okay. And that goes back to the licensing. I was lock, literally locking the door when Governor Newsom decided that wineries were exempt. Right. And so I had a license to make wine, so I so, stayed open. And there's two parts of it. Here, there was no tourism, yeah. right? There's well, 6,000 not... residents of yeah, St. Right. Helena, I think, yeah. is the number. Some, I, we were at a charity event last night. I think it's 6,000 people. I just people. noticed that Oakville is 300. Right. So... so Six thousand total people, right? Yeah. You take kids out. You take you know people are past drinking. People can't drink. Right. All out. The the population is 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 tiny. Right. And we couldn't. And a lot of our staff left uh, because they couldn't afford the rent or or whatever. So we were skeleton staff. So we did carry out, take out. You know, um, curbside pickup, local delivery and shipping only for six months wow same thing in new jersey ironically the governor of new jersey on the uh 17th i think said saturday the 21st i'm gonna let the state know what's man being closed and what's not yeah we were told under good advice that he would never close the liquor stores uh for many reasons yeah one new york wasn't two Lots of reasons. Uh, we were so mobbed in our stores. It was out of control. Wow. Um, on the 19th and 20th, as a family, we decided not to reopen on the 21st. So even though the governor gave permission to, 
we closed our doors what a for decision. in store traffic. I, I couldn't risk the 150 employees' yeah. help. Uh, and we went to 100% curbside pickup wow. and delivery and shipping. And it created a monumental task. Task? Uh, and tell me about the sales volume. Oh, uh, we doubled. Uh, doubled with, with a whole different logistical pattern. Well, that logistics. The, the problem is it took time, you know, so the first two weeks we were, it took four or five days to get product out of the yeah. building. Um, but then things started to click. My, my son, who was getting his MBA at the time, but now living at home, uh, was always helping us with technology and stuff. So we had a mobile app already. Uh, we, you know, way before most people had mobile apps. Wow. And um, he created an off-site um, phone system because our phones couldn't handle all the calls no. coming in. And we hired a bunch of people from Marriott with rewards program that were furloughed. So when you called Gary's Wine Marketplace, the person answering the phone was a professional. Wow. And they were able to get to the point of solving the problem. They probably couldn't do it themselves, right. but they would either call, they had, uh, we had this technology called Slack, instant communication. Yeah, yeah, Slack. So they would go right to we the store and say, hey, Madison, um, where is Mrs. Smith's order? And they would say, oh, it's on the truck, we'll be there in a half hour. So that's we, fascinating. So then I heard a, Hertz was going out of business. So I got a connection to Hertz and we, we rented like 10 Hertz trucks for virtually nothing. So we could up our delivery game. Then we expanded. We were closed, right? So we were open. We had people coming in 10 to 6. So I said expand it. So we expanded from 6 to 10 and had three shifts. And then we went from 6 to two in the morning or 12 to two uh, and we went to three shifts so we always had pack because you, you have to pull the you have to accept the order you have to pack and pull it you have to check it pack it then you have to deliver it bag it you have to if, so yeah, the right, logistics on the right truck here it was it was death nothing. by one nail at a time nothing so we did a lot of virtual tastings Virtually every night after work, I did a virtual taste. Yeah, which and were, we yeah, were shipping are. product out of here for yeah. those. But it was it was you know that that's was, fascinating in, in in New Jersey. Just to touch on that for a minute, because we we did similar. We were into, but I'm a DTC guy. And I really was about shipping anyway. And since we got to stay open, uh, you know, we did very well. We were like we were double. We were forty yeah. percent higher. They would sell, yeah. they would buy anything I told them to. Yeah. But what was interesting on the supply side is that some of these people a predicted b rerouted their truck their boats some had lots of inventory to sell and some had none. nothing and one of the more interesting things a place like austin hope came as silver oak who would never come see me before because they didn't need me were banging on my door saying we need some sales right and i said you know if you if you stick with me after this is over i'll buy from you and i was able to sell all those things i was able to sell liters of camus for 139 i couldn't keep it in stock yeah and now i when when it was all over i couldn't sell it to save my life and so the, the consumerism has changed so radically. So what, when did you reopen the store? So we reopened in June. I think it was the end of May, June. Um, but here it didn't matter because there was so little, bit, you know, there was no tourism. Um, in New Jersey, it was a battle, you know, because we were still doing curbside local delivery and people shopping in the store so it was it was a challenge for the first probably four or five months after we reopened did you did you expect when you bought this store that because it's huge i mean from a retail standpoint you know what do you use the metric is dollars per square foot and those kinds of things did you expect more or expect less or just nothing we predicted expected budgeted for worked yeah uh it's it's a it's a it's a nightmare yeah. you know sorry I, to hear that and i love napa yeah. you know i, right I love being course. here um but if you think about it a you know fire round of fires pandem pandemic another fire slowest two tourist seasons ever uh were while we've been open and now that we're open and you saw it it's be it's busy it's yeah, hot it's busy. yeah people are tasting we have no wine salespeople. Yeah, so <laughs> that's all other subject. 
um, uh. you you mentioned that earlier. And I, I, I told you about a post on Facebook where that referred to that old song from the '70s and '60s, "Long-haired freak." You know, due to the shortage of employees, long-haired freak people may apply now. Yeah, and uh, and but that doesn't tell us if you have any experience in anything. Right. And I think everybody in this industry. I think all industries are suffering from that, but now you have an extra layer where you need some kind of wine knowledge. Yeah, I mean, yes. And I, I've argued with people in New Jersey in the past that do our wine associates need knowledge? I've always said yes. I had a manager that worked for me said no. Hmm. I'd rather a great personality that we steal from a jewelry store or a clothing store and literally wind them up and say, sell this, this, and this, go to it. I've always, I've come from passion and knowledge. Yeah, I think you're right. And that's what I would rather. Here, because of the two different demogra <clears throat> demographics, we have the, uh, the uber educated, and yes. you can't screw around with that. Right, yes. Right? Right. The last thing you want to do is say to a winemaker, and sometimes you know and sometimes you don't. Yeah, right. They don't come in and say with a sign, I own a vineyard or yeah. I'm a winemaker. I have a PhD in the knowledge. Right. They come in and, and if you don't know who they are, you yeah. may not know. Right. You can't bullshit them. No. The consumers, from my point of view, you can't lie to. Right? I just, that's no, not how can't. we. No, so, so if somebody asks me if I've had, I say yes or no. Um, and right now, the three people that are selling wine, me, uh, Mariko, the general manager, and Alex, our assistant manager, all have tasted a lot of wine. You know, Alex has a degree from the Culinary Institute and as a chef and has done a lot of tastings. Um, but we have other jobs. And so to, to buy and then put it away and sell, it's a, it's a challenge. And it puts a limiting a limit on what we can accomplish well it, particularly watch and i profess through this podcast and all my career is you need to find a shop that you like you need to you need to find a buyer of in that shop that understands what you like and so that if you're going to experiment with new varietals and new styles and, and break away from let's just say napa cabs somebody needs to understand your palate and you're not going to get it at the supermarket if you go to the supermarket, there's Josh and, uh, you know, Apothic Red and all the formula wines, and that's no help. And in fact, so she said that in Hermosa Beach, there's a Vons. And I was doing this selfie video criticizing Snoop Dogg's perfect position uh, yeah. at a 999, you know. And this woman came over, a young girl, and she asked what I was doing. And I told her, and I told her what I did. And she, so we got this incredible philosophical conversation about wine. And I said, you want to work for me? Because you do not belong in a department at a supermarket. Right. You belong in a place, let's say, like Gary's Marketplace. Because she really understood it. I was so fascinated by this girl. And yeah, she fell in love and moved to Tennessee. But <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do about it? So how do you find people here? And how important is it? That, I mean, I think you're right. How important? We already know the answer. I think that you need somebody that can listen to what the consumer is saying. You can't bullshit them and guide them to a place where they feel comfortable making that purchase. This is an emotional buy. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And to take it back a step, because it's a, two, you know, and we need two types of people, right? A, the buyer. And in this store, the buyer has to be the seller. Right, yes. But the buyer has to know, know the market. Right? What what imports do we need to carry? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what's a must burgundy we have to have? What grower champagnes do we have to have? Then who am I going to sell that grower champagne to? Oh, I know Bill, the winemaker from X, comes in every Thursday. He loves grower champagne. When he comes in, I'm going to mention it to him. So that's one style person. Yeah. That's ha that's the harder find, right? Um, and How about the the geek, the wine geek? And it must be hundreds that come through Napa that just because they drink the most expensive yeah. stuff they can find think they know it all so so we met some of them looking for work you know come and look for a job most of them want to buy not sell yeah right uh, everybody wants want to, to be a buyer employee discount nobody oh, wants they want to be the buyer on the inside yeah oh sure they want to make the buying decisions not yeah. the selling decisions right. so so, yeah. so that's a problem and a little knowledge is could be a lot of tr trouble and you have to know how much to buy when to buy 
how to sell it. Those have to go together. The second person, which I thought would be easier, is the, I'll call it part-time person. It could be one day a week. You know, if we had seven part-time people each working one day a week. Yeah, right. And all they want to do is sell wine. Yeah. And know enough. We have enough to, we, we can keep them busy. We have enough guests coming in. Right now, we have none. We don't have either. We don't have that. Wow. That, I'll call them the geek, but the, the, it's a business mindset as opposed to just a geek, right? Somebody that knows what to buy, how to buy, how much to buy, when to buy it, how to sell, who to sell. And then the, the passionate, I'm going to say young person, but it, it could be a retired, you know, whatever. Somebody that just wants to schmooze. We were talking about that uh, Ohio, uh, the influencer I interviewed on the show, who bought a store in Ohio. It's like 5,000 feet. It's a pretty good sized store. 50 employees. He said most of them are retired. Yeah. And they love wine and they want to talk about it. But at the same time, you have to know what questions to ask because you have to ask them to take a bottle with them when they leave. I mean, right. there's salesmanship involved with this too, right? It's not just... And I had, I, over the years, my employees, I've had three or four that are really interested in wine that carried on that torch and learned how to sell. But most of them, you know, they just move on to something else. They don't really grab the passion of it. And that's what yeah. I think it takes here. Yeah, no, in New Jersey, we're able to get some of them. Uh, and I, it's, again, to the decision of coming here, right. it's something I totally misread. I, and what does I, Mrs. say about this now after you... <laughs> she listens to everything I say now because, uh, <laughs> you know, we love Napa, yeah, right? We, sure. have a, we, we bought a home in St. Helena. Yeah, right. um, it's a great place for us. Uh, but we're both very frustrated, yeah. you know, and my I'm son is in the business. It's, it's, it's disappointing. So do you think, and I noticed, I don't remember last time we were here if I saw that deli counter, but you're making yeah. deli sandwiches. I mean, Odin and DeLuca did those kinds of things. Um, is that helping? Yeah, I, I, and again, the plan was if we're going to do food, which this footprint has to yes. by the size, right. we've got to do it Napa style. Yeah. Um, and I'm not talking about Napa, you know, as a type of food, no, but no, no, high yes. quality. Right. right. People come through, they want this experience. You get a chef for three months and then they're gone. Right, yeah. Uh, so we've decided, you know, we have great recipes uh, done by a uh, fantastic executive chef that mm -hmm. consulted for us. And he's trained the kitchen. But instead of having one executive chef, we have three people. You know, one is in charge of the um, counter for making the sandwiches. We have somebody in charge of prep and somebody in charge of the rest of the kitchen. It's just like uh, regular kitchen. And everybody's working it. It's like know, another it's, restaurant. And that, it, it's exactly what it is. Two different things. Um, but again, we're short staff. Yeah. My daughter's a French trained boulangere. She worked in New York. She worked for Jonathan Benno. She, she, and that gave me a huge uh, eye awakening to what it takes. To, you know, everybody, everybody wants, I'm going to open a sports bar and have right. chicken wings and you know, women with big boobs. And it, it's like, there's so much work to it. You know, and I, because of my daughter's experience, I've learned that I still want to try it. Might bring her home from New York. No, you know, and, and I no, I it's just my brain. She got now, it, it's it's funny because when when I did this, I said, oh, you know, one of the many misjudges, right? We're in Napa Valley. We're right near the Culinary Institute. There's all these great restaurants. <clears throat> Somebody's gonna want to not work every night and weekend yeah right and it, we, impossible no uh all the wine geeks we got to find people impossible because well one of the things too that this is sort of more political than it is uh business but you know it's hard to live up here uh, at the wages that are paid in general like i had this great conversation with a tasting room manager not too long ago i was interviewing the barrett sisters and She's telling me about having to go to the low income housing authority to put a bid on a house so she could live in Santa Rosa, you know, beautiful home. Her husband was a dual income, but just that threshold wasn't there. She had to make sure she didn't make too much money the next two years, only to work in the valley. And I know this is a big issue. We're gonna have to get into the political side of it, but that has to play into this. I mean Oh, absolutely. I mean Absolutely. Where, where you, do you come? You hit come over the hill every morning. At and I think drive. that's, you know, so it's Napa, right? Uh, which is not cheap, <clears throat> but not as expensive. Excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. Water here, 
<clears throat> I can edit this. Don't worry. Oh, Steady State. That's our friend Josh. I love Josh. He was in a, a little bit ago, buying burgundy. Was he? Oh, because we were up for Christmas. We went to this little Christmas party. And his dad, too. Chris is a great uh, Chris, guy. I love him. I see the ad vivum. Yeah, 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 we're doing that. You know, uh, Chris is a great. That's a great family, and that's you know, it goes back to what makes this so great, right? Yes. As soon as I moved into town, I met Chris in the gym, started chatting, went over to his house for a pizza party. Yeah, yeah, he loves pizza. Uh, <laughs> loves making pizza. Met Josh, became friends with him. Yeah. Uh, his Cabernet was our best-selling Cabernet last year. Really, in Outbeat the grounded one. Yeah. Wow. Outbeat Josh Cabernet. That's amazing. Yeah, because we loved it's it. Way, it's way better. It's significantly better, mm -hmm. and we, we went and made it our wine of the year. Well, wow, congratulations. And That's it's great. about, you know, it's about that. family, you know, and, and, and to me, they're like family. And that's the bonus of this. Yes. I, I, can't, I can't figure out how to get through the negative that's right true. now. It's, it's, I'm trying, you I'm know. I'm glad you got to go get pizza with Chris and Josh, and I end up at Charter Oak drinking frozen space age rose. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Frosés or whatever you call yeah, them. Yeah, he loves that stuff. <laughs> but I, I'll tell you, after I'd rather have pizza at, uh, at Chris's <laughs> you did, house. You did much better. So, what what's today's plan? What what you know? How are we gonna? Well, let's let me before we get to that. How has consumerism then changed from? Because for me, pre COVID, my life pre COVID was I go to work, things look pretty good, train some people, buy some wine, you know, you know, it was kind of an autopilot, you know, and then. COVID hit and I was like, wow, this is really great. And then it's, it's, it literally has tanked uh, for me on the, now I'm talking about internet marketing, influencer yeah. marketing, you know, affiliate marketing, you know, Facebook, all that stuff we did in-house digital design, you know, and how has it changed from the consumer side of standpoint? Have you seen this shift of what they think? I think there's been a burnout. First off, you know, you, you go from literally run, 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 right. You do everything. And then, yeah. You, you're like in a cocoon right and for us uh, what happened with sales we couldn't sell private label or our direct right because people wanted Josh yeah that's and what they Kendall wanted. Jackson right. and sure. Santa Margarita you know and all the names right uh, uh, Clico, you know yes. they were buying everything name brand right um, once it reopened we had to retrain people that hey if you like this you love that mm -hmm. if you love this you're gonna love that so so that changed i i think uh the the then the economy got a little dicey mm -hmm. right for and sure still is a little dicey and so people maybe are not willing to spend as much money i think that's accurate um so that's it that's become a challenge um because during COVID, they would spend more money like i said i could uh, 139 dollars for a liter of camus is like I could never sell this before. I had guys that used to go out to dinner two, three times a week, right? Entertaining clients. Yeah. Now they're sitting home. And so if for, they would call me up and say, hey, Gary, I have, I have three of my best clients I would normally take to dinner. Uh, can we do a, a virtual, just four people, me, wow. uh, you, wow, and three great. of my clients. That's great. And can you send them these three bottles, or get, pick three bottles of wine, no more than a thousand bucks for the three bottles. Oh yeah, just keep it around a thousand. Because bucks. if they went to dinner, it'd be more. Yeah, right. And so that's what I would do. I would, I would, you know, so you'd create these experiences. That's amazing. But now that's gone. That's so, hard work. So, so, and that was hard work in its own way, yeah. uh, but very rewarding. I, I think what we're going to see for the short term is a continuing. I think so. Um, maybe even shrinkage. You know, it's going to be harder and harder to sell that $150 Napa cap unless tourism comes rolling back. Uh, and I'm optimistic that it will. Uh, whether we could, if it does come back in all its glory, how are we going to take care of everybody? Yeah. Or then we need people to do it right. It's a problem. We, we actually made an offer on a house in, in Yonville a few weeks ago, a few months ago, actually, <clears> and the, I couldn't get the guy to come down. I mean, I'm talking about 8%, please. Eight, and, that we've, and, and for the same reason that you love it here, the relationships that we've built over the years, um, but certainly wine is, you know, the, the ambiance of wine, the understanding of wine is an important part of my lifestyle. And yeah. We're never going to ever leave that. It's never going to leave us ever. But... Um, we we appreciate being up here and strolling the streets and taking it easy and talking wine because it is a fun subject. It's an academic subject. 
um, I've been trying to sort through my head with this show, and I have, I want to tell, I'm going to send you a link to another show I'm creating. Is how we get consumers to f- get that same passion that we have. It's, it seems to be a hand sell, no matter what we do. Oh, absolutely! Because you you want to sell it the way I fell in love with wine. Right. Right. It's a it's not a manufactured product. Right. It's not going to taste the same every day. It's 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 made by my friend Louis Martini. Yeah. It's it's That's huge. It's made by the Novaks for Spotswood. Yeah. You know, when you know, this morning we went to the farmers market. Uh oh, they have one here? in Saint Lena. It's yeah. great. It was yeah. great. On our way, my wife and I through the farmers market saw uh three or four famous winemakers. Really just Well, Chris Phelps. Oh, I mean, Chris, was there, uh, yeah. Chris, you know, and well, his office is right there. And too. they got the grandkids and, yeah, and right. they're and they're buying produce yeah. and, and another famous winemaker is coming to dinner in, in a couple of weeks yeah. uh, and it it's a sense of community that's great but but I love that part of it if a consumer just walks into a grocery store it's it's a faceless nameless product yeah. right it's got it's Snoop Dogg on it's it true. or something else and it's not a it's a ma- what did you call manufactured yeah it's use a, it. right I, I want a person's product. I want formula wine. Yeah, formula you call. I want something made by my friend. Yeah. It's a tough it's a tough sell for us to, to do that. And the conversation about celebrity wines, we haven't even we're almost on an hour already, so I don't want to take too much more of your time. But um, it seems like uh, I'll, I'll give you a brief synopsis of the show I want to do and, and close plays into what you're saying. And that is the show is not about swirling a sniffing, it's a wine show. And, and the first production, productionist people I told it to loved the idea. But when, when you say the word wine, they're, they're, the Hollywood saying 99% of the people are not going to watch because they don't care about wine. Right. Because what they don't care about is the psalm standing in front of the camera going like this. Right. But the stories that you can tell about Louis Martini, the stories about the Nazis in Germany, the stories about you know, Attila the Hun coming to Champagne and Napoleon coming through during the Renaissance, during the Revolution, you know, those are real stories. And I think. Like even Chris's experience in Bordeaux, right. Christian Moex and all that, all that has to roll into the bottle. You may not taste a certain tannic component or some flavor, you know, some cedar box. Whatever. But I think the history of that person making the wine and the farmer is in this bottle. Absolutely. And it may not be the person that made that wine, but it's the experience that you had with that wine. Right. I'll give you a great example. Um, one of my favorite stories. Um, uh, D- Dick from Sainsbury, Dick mm-hmm. Ward, mm-hmm. may rest in peace. Yes. Uh, years ago, I was visiting Dick and Linda at their house in St. Helena, uh, a premier Napa trip. I think it was a premier Napa trip. And uh, they said, uh, the sun was setting, and they said, oh, before dinner, we want to take you up to the water tower. And on their property, they have a water tower. Wow. And so he grabs a bottle of Bollinger Grandinet, yeah, nice. uh, Marcona almonds, yeah. and some olives. Puts it in a basket, and you we you know you go up the spiral staircase wow. <laughs> to the top of this water tower. Yeah. And we sat there for an hour. We drank a bottle of uh, Bollinger yeah. and watched the sunset. It was, and it, I'm telling you, it's probably 15 years ago now. Yeah. But I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah, that's the experience. And the experience, and that's what turns people into passionate pe- wine people. It's not just having a bottle of, you know, opening up a bottle of wine while you're cooking by yourself and, and just drinking it down, right? It's, it's about creating a memory. Yeah, you know? it totally is. It, it, my favorite story of that realm is I get texts, right? You probably do too, actually, from customers in front of the Parthenon or the Coliseum. With a glass, with an old-fashioned glass, with a glass of their favorite wine now, which is some local Italian yeah. thing, right? And they can you get it for me? And so I get it. For, this happened more than a half a dozen times. I get it for them, and then they pick it up, same vintage, everything. They say it doesn't taste the same. Absolutely. I'm like, well, because you're not on vacation in front of the Parthenon, and the kids aren't pulling on your shirt tails. Yeah, absolutely. Because wine is about that experience. And I think that I think that's one of the reasons that the headwinds the wine of the month club, my my club has had. Is you have a club here now? You have a DTC? Yeah. Okay. 
So you have an experience to sell. You can come in here like I did and I watched and I noticed how many people were standing by your tasting bar and there's somebody telling them what's going on. You were talking to them. That's part of the experience. Every time they get that box, they're going to come back to that experience. Right. They're going to think about that. And it, that's where, in our industry, that metric, which is how many months they're going to stick around and get wine from you, is such an important metric. It comes from that memory. The boss was out here. Gary was out here talking to me. That's Absolutely. huge. And when I sold the old days, when I stood at a fair and shook the hand of the member that signed up at the LA County Fair wine tasting, or whatever we were doing, Orange County Fair tasting, those are the memories those people have. And it's lost on the internet. It's completely lost. Completely. The and the influencer thing, you know, which is a whole... It's a hoax. What do they know? I it's mean, I'm, and, and some, some quote-unquote influencers are great. Yeah, I, in general, <laughs> it's their hoax. Um, but, I, you know, I, I, I don't want somebody off in... It's like an advertisement, a commercial. I want somebody that knows the product. If I go to a butcher, I want the, I want the guy... If I'm going to a local butcher <laughs> shop, I want the guy behind the thing to know... That is a funny vision that you just gave me. The butcher's back there. He's cutting the meat. But there's an influencer out in front of the store going, you ought to get the ground beef that's 70-30. And you're like, why? Goes, yeah, because it's I have 40,000 people following me. That's so <laughs> funny because you're 100, we, we've created this visual. Exactly. Right? And that's the cartoon. You've yeah. got the butcher who, who knew what cow it was. Right. And he cut it a certain way. Right. And, and if you want a, a filet, this is the which one you want and this is how long you should cook it and right. this is why and you've got somebody outside telling you it has nothing to do with it nothing to do with it do you do that kind of well, we're going to wrap this up now do you do social yes and do you have a group for that one person the answer is yes, yes. I mean we have we have one primary person yeah. in New Jersey yeah. that oversees all social uh, she does some of it but in the in the stores if stuff is happening the local store person I think, will do. I think from a local standpoint that's has the best benefit for any of these things. Yeah, I agree. In a, in a, in a it, global world. I will learn, I have four, you know Don Schliff from no. Wine Warehouse? No. He, he ran Wine Warehouse for 100 years. He, was, he sold to my father in 1972. Wow. Was, we were old friends and I was a teenager. Um, he, did a, he did a tasting. He's probably got the greatest port collection in the world in Glendale. Yeah. And so he did a vertical on the vineyard, um, Quinta Noval Vineyard, the one that has wow. Philoxera. From the 1800s to the, you know, Suckling was there. We were all there, right? I posted a video of him just opening with his heated tongs. Oh, yeah. It's like a minute. It has 4.5 million views on TikTok and a million views on Instagram. Can I tell you how much dollars came from that? None. Zero. My son, my son says that all the time. Yeah. He says, just because you, you post something, if it doesn't generate dollars... What's it's not for really, and you. Right. And if you're not doing it, when I, the point I was going to make is since you're doing it locally, you need to stay local, because yeah. probably seventy percent of the people that watch this thing don't even live anywhere near the United States. Yeah. And so you've, there's really no value to any of this. And the the uh, the influencers the same way. The wine influencers uh, just, just doing this, and they go to the liquor store and they buy a bottle of something and they taste it, and people think this. They're just entertaining themselves. They're not. Right. It's enter that's a great way. It's, it's not educational, it's entertainment. Yeah, it's just entertainment. And if you think about it as education, you're making a mistake. I hope we can do this again. Uh, fascinating conversation. We can go on forever. I know we can. It's so funny because you said it's the time is almost up, but I'm like, you're, you must be very good at your job because I didn't realize how long <laughs> we've been talking. We were talking about, well, when you talk about wine and you talk about business, the business of wine, um, you know, it's it, you and I could talk for a long time. And Absolutely. I really appreciate your experience and, and what you've done because this is really hard work. And uh, congratulate you on doing it. I know this store is a struggle, but uh, man, uh, you stay in there. I think it's going to be fine. I think I th for sure ter the vintage house at Yonville was slammed today. Yeah. Slammed. Weddings. You know, yeah, there's a lot going room. on. I think you're going to be all right. But just get well, we hope so. I just, uh, if you know any, if you want to get back in retail, work, <laughs> come back just work a half a day every <laughs> other if I, day. If I get this house <laughs> in the office, I get this guy to come down 5%, maybe we'd be up here. So You got a deal. Thank you very much but for a pleasure. coming Cheers. Up. I appreciate it. Thank you.